everybody. I'm Marilyn, CEO and founder of Cosmic Centers and your host for the third edition of the annual Cosmic Conference. This year we are covering all, we're discussing all about the employee experience. And to better understand it, we're covering it from a wide variety of angles. Um, today we'll be talking about the importance of imprintable moments in the employee experience. We've talked about um, you know, the office, we've talked about organizational strategy, we've talked about purpose and values and culture, and there are so many more topics coming up this week. Until October 21st, we will be joined by managers, thought leaders, academics, experts who are sharing their insights and experiences and perspectives on the employee experience. Do join us. All of the information is available on our conference website, which we will link in the comments. Should you want to either rewatch some of the episodes from the previous week, read some of the content that we've created for you, or even um, make sure to RSVP for some of the upcoming discussions so that you don't miss out on them. And before we begin, as always, share the love, give us a like, tell us where you're joining us from, leave your thoughts or feedback or questions in the comments, and Jillian and I will do our best to get to those before the session ends. Let me introduce Jillian. Jillian is expert in residence employee experience at WorkVivo. WorkVivo is the employee communication platform designed to foster natural, meaningful connections in teams, allowing companies to reach and engage their employees in ways that traditional tools simply can't. Jillian is a veteran chief people officer and an expert at scaling high growth businesses and building strong organizational culture. She's an organizational behaviorist, podcast host, and a frequent speaker at industry events. Prior to joining WorkVivo, Jillian served as Chief People Officer at Cubic Telecom, where she oversaw all aspects of people strategy, development, culture, employee engagement, policies, and practices. She was previously Chief People Officer at Car Trawler, where she was an integral member of the leadership team for 12 years and scaled the business from 25 to 550 people. Before turning her skills to the technology sector, Jillian spent eight years at leading hotel group Juris Doyle, where she held several senior leadership roles across a range of departments and properties. Jillian, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh my God, thank you. Thanks for the intro. Um, no, I'm really excited. Um, so many different industries also to quiz you about. So I'm really yeah. looking forward to hearing, you know, your experience across, uh, you know, those from the hospitality industry where, you mm. know, frontline workers all the way to tech where it's all about knowledge workers. It's really interesting to see how you might, you know, bring that perspective into our discussion today. Thank you so much for making the time for us. No problem at all. Honored to be here. Thank you. So we actually reached out to you after having read um, an article that you wrote for WorkVivo all about the imprintable moments in the employee experience. And then as we were discussing, discovered so many more angles that we wanted to cover today. So yes, we're going to be talking about how the employee experience involves every touch point, how it's important to make sure that across every moment in that journey, from onboarding to offboarding, collaborating, using tools, everything in the middle, upskilling, you know, getting feedback, whatever it is, it is important to think about how we create the right learning moments and the right, you know, moments for creating memories across the journey so that we can have a strong and lasting positive effect. Um, we're going to talk about the fundamentals of the employee experience. We will discuss imprintable moments. And then I'd love to spend a bit of time talking to you about leadership. Um, you have such an interesting perspective on um, you know, how leadership is shaped today and how we can evolve even the concept of leadership in our organizations to be more inclusive. So let's get this started. Are you ready? I am. Yeah. All right. So define employee experience in your own terms and what you think are fundamental to mastering a great employee experience. Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> I love that question. <laughs> um, well, I think a great, if you were to do like a one liner, what is a great employee experience? It's where an employee feels that they can be themselves and that they belong, you know, so that you ultimately feel that you belong to the organization and you can be yourself. I think that's ultimately what all employers and leaders should aspire, because when one is in that state, they absolutely get the best out of that employee. I think employee experience, you know, if you were to, to drill down and to the different components, it, it covers multitudes of things. But ultimately, that is when I think about employees coming into an organization that I'm part of, I want to create an organization to which people want to belong. And I think that's the fundamentals of uh, employee experience. Now, there's lots of different layers to that, but that would be at a high level what I would mm -hmm. feel each leader and organization should be working towards. Brilliant completely agree on that. I think when we 
at Cosmic Centers, when we're talking to people about how to think through their employee experience, where you started is there is absolutely the right place, which is like to set a vision for how you want people to show up and come to work wherever that is every day. Um, and then as we kind of, as you say, as we peel that onion and mm -hmm. kind of look at the layers below it, we call this the omni-channel organization, where we say like as a um, someone who manages or designs or puts in place employee experience, you want to look at the physical sphere. So like the office or the place where people work from it doesn't have to be the office. You want to look at the social sphere. So how people connect and engage with each other. And then the work sphere, everything from processes, tools, policies, managers, you know, et cetera, et cetera. What are perhaps some of the touch points um, that, you know, you love particularly working on when it comes to designing or redesigning employee experiences? So I obviously work with an amazing company that that's what they do all day long is looking to how can we improve? And that's the mission of WorkVivo is to improve the global um, workplace experience for everybody, you know. Um, but when I think of employee experience, the first thing I start with is leadership and people managers. I think you have to have to get those right because I'll obviously come on to things like communication, connection, community, tools. But if you don't have your people managers or your leaders right the rest becomes very, very difficult. So whenever I start with an organization, I make sure they get a really you know, good idea of the people managers that we have in place, make sure that they're trained and developed and give them the tools and skill set that they need in order to look after the people. Because I see it all too often, organizations investing a lot of money and really their people managers just aren't where they need to be and they end up frustrating the employees so everything else they're putting on top is a poor foundation so you need to get your leadership team and your people managers absolutely right give them what they need to be the best that they can be and make sure you're hiring people that genuinely like people not just putting experts into role hire people that are you know interested in people want to see people get on and then invest in them train in them and then give them the tools so obviously work vivo is a tool as you know that helps organizations and people leaders you know, uh, like manage their employee engagement or employee experience and communication within the organization. So I see a lot of times now in dealing with uh, organizations and leadership teams, they don't have the tools to actually deliver the really good employee experience um, needed. But I would say start with training and developing your people leaders and then give them the tools to ensure that they can actually do that then once they're trained uh, would be a starting point anyway. I love that. I know when I met you, I told you that I felt like I was talking to myself and I would have a really hard time disagreeing. <laughs> and, uh, funny enough, someone asked me the same question last week when I was presenting our uh, framework and I said the same thing that you said. And um, one data point that I just want to add to that is that when it comes, for example, to measuring employee engagement, 70% um, of the variance in the employee engagement scores actually relate to managers. Um, and so I couldn't agree more. I think it doesn't matter what like bells and whistles you have around them. If you don't have people who genuinely care about making that experience the best it possibly can be. And also people who genuinely believe that this has a real impact on the business side, you know, um, it, you shouldn't need a business case to do what's right. But it's important that you have an instinct about the fact that taking care of your people means taking care of your business uh, mm -hmm. and that it, one will lead to an improved top and bottom line. And if you strongly believe in that, the rest will just happen on its own. So I really, yeah, no, uh, I appreciate you bringing that up. Yeah, but I also think as well, just think of yourself, you know, like I always go back to when I'm in the workplace, if I have a really great boss, you know, that's brilliant. It, it makes my day. But I have someone that I'm avoiding like the plague or they're terrorizing me all day long. Like I'm not doing my best and I know I'm not. So I think sometimes all we need to do is kind of look to the, the humans uh, as in our own human reaction to things and, and you know, apply the same the same logic. We're all human at the end of the day and our boss has a big impact on our lives and our family's life. Um, so, yeah, we have to get those right um, for people to ensure that they're happy in the workplace. I love that. OK, I have another question for you. Of course, when we're talking about employee experience, um, one of the first things that comes up because it's what's most closely associated for a lot of people is this idea of organizational culture and purpose and values. Um, you know, when I talk about it to clients or, or having a discussion about it, the way I like to 
let's say present culture is the following. And then I'll ask you what you think are the most important artifacts. But the way I tell them this is a lot of people think like culture and purpose and values is just about writing those things down somewhere and making sure everybody can recite them back to you. Um, but the way I love to present it to people so they really understand how to think about their values is imagine that a hundred years from now, um, an anthropologist, you know, discovers all of the artifacts of your company, right? They discover your documentation, your policies, um, pictures of events that you held. Like, imagine they're re-exploring your culture and they find all these objects. There is not a single human there to explain to them, oh, our values was like, whatever, integrity, whatever it was. Um, and if they're able from all of these things to reconstitute what your culture looked like, then you've done a great job, right? So it's more about the artifacts and making sure that your culture lives in everything that you do, as opposed to just simply documenting it, even though, of course, that's an essential first step. What are some of the culture vehicles, you know, that you think are really important that people miss? I think culture and bringing culture to life in an organization and purpose and, and even strategic objectives, I think these are all areas that leaders really, really struggle with. I think that they're all, you know, delighted to, to get them. And it's nearly like, again, a task get the values down so we know and then they'll pull them out when they need to deal with something or someone um, and they use them for the wrong purposes you know uh, so and so is not doing great and would use the values to sit down and have a chat with them about that rather than incorporating it into everything they do storytelling like I really think leaders struggle in bringing that to life to say like I just said there you know the mission of WorkVivo is to improve global workplace experience and everything that we do is around that so when I'm speaking or you know or writing articles and printable moments I wrote that article because I hope that people see it and it will improve you know something for someone on the end of it but I will explain it in that way I think a lot of times leaders don't have that storytelling skill set they don't truly understand how to you know give examples and um, you know work it into their day to day I mean I remember um, a long time ago Charles O'Reilly from Stanford was doing a culture talk and he was saying to um, you know the leadership team there just when you think you have spoken about culture and values and what the business means just where you think you literally can't talk the bile is reaching the top you're so sick of talking he said continue to talk and never stop talking about it but I really don't think leaders are you know speaking about culture that way and you have to keep it alive and you have to make it okay for the employees to keep it alive and feel that they are responsible for it too I think when I see even someone was asking me about a, a title there recently that said, oh, maybe chief people and culture officer. And I was like, no, I don't think so, because you're it's as if you're delegating the culture to that poor person. And really, the culture is up to everyone in the organization. And I would regularly when my time in car trollers keep saying to employees, do you still feel it? Can you feel it? Or is it not? And be honest with me, you know, as soon as you and I'd have a few of the particularly longer serving employees and I'd start saying to them, once if you feel like you don't belong or you feel like, you know, something's not right when well, you need to tell me, because that's when I know if the culture is still alive or if it needs to pivot or if something's going on or we're going in the wrong direction. Um, because I think sometimes leaders might think that it's a bit annoying having to do this and set it but it actually speeds up decision-making so quickly if you get it right. Um, but anyway, sorry, I've gone on too long, Marilyn. Not at all. <laughs> I'll let you jump in there, sorry. No, 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 no. Um, actually, I was just going to say, um, I think it's really interesting what you're saying because, um, you know, I think that purpose and culture and, and our values as an organization need to be as strong of a guardrail uh, as our brand is, you know, like oftentimes when a company is considering an extension or some new business activity, you look at the brand and you're like, oh, but our brand won't, you know, be able to extend that far. Like if tomorrow Work Vivo were to start, I don't know, making jeans, you might say, well, I mean, Work Vivo as a brand wouldn't really fit, right? Yeah. Um, but I do think that you should also say no to business opportunities based on your culture and values, uh, and they should be guardrails for your business making decisions. So I, I really appreciate that point about facilitating decision making. Mm -hmm. And earlier you were saying that leaders, in order to be able to, um, to really kind of activate the organization around these, they need to be great storytellers. Mm -hmm. um, a question here from the audience as well is like, what skill is the most important for leaders today? Storytelling being one of them, what other skills do you think were suddenly kind of brought to light uh, in the post-pandemic workplace? <sighs> 
Oh, I I actually think that is such a big question because I think leadership is at a, a huge crossroads. And I think the leaders that have gotten us this far are probably in the skill sets that they've had are not the ones that are required for our next phase. Um, so I think it's a really interesting time to be a leader. I think it's a really interesting time in any sort of leadership development because I think that it needs to change. If you were to say one core skill set or, or one um, for me, if I was hiring a leader in the morning, I would want them to be empathetic. I would want them to be able, from a customer's perspective, from an employee's perspective, be able to understand and come at it from different angles and different needs and wants from people and to understand that and truly understand it. I think um, other, you know, skill sets will be long term sustainability. So a leader who's able to think long term, not transactional, not short term. I think we've had that working from quarter to quarter, hitting results, being very transactional. Now we need a leader that can think whole systems holistically and really have a kind of a le- low ego um, is the requirement now going forward because we have to build responsible, sustainable build- businesses going forward. I think the era of extract and you know fast and short term and results in the short term um will not play a role going forward it'll it'll take a while to die out for sure but um you're going to see an emergence i think of a new leader um and it's you know it'll be better for all of us and for the planet and our futures i mean that sounds like a dream and you and i will talk about you know the the attributes of leadership that we hope to see emerging in the future. Um, but before we get to that, I want to talk about the concept of imprintable moments, mm. because when I read it, I felt so connected to what you were uh, writing about. So let's start off by just the definition of what imprintable moments <laughs> Well, again, it's my my definition, but I think there's in everybody's, you know, life and, and we're talking about employees. So your employee life cycle, there are imprintable moments, which are really, really important moments to the employee. They are moments where you need support, where you feel vulnerable um, and you're really relying on the organization to be there for you. And these are kind of defining moments around the relationship with your employee and employer. Um, So an example would be returning from maternity leave. A really big, big day for, you know, um, a person coming back into the office and we can get it so right and really, you know, do right by the person. And and in that would generate a lot of loyalty and retention or we can get it really wrong. And and it has a really bad um, imprinted moment on that person's brain and damages the relationship um, and the trust and will take it a long time to to build back up. Another imprintable moment, I think, was uh, during COVID where people were like, you know, oh, can't wait to go back to the office. So they were all excited and everyone was talking about it and getting dressed up and heading in. And a lot of organizations didn't have any milk in the fridge. It was got off. You know, the desks were all disorganized. The place was freezing. Anyone that was in was on their laptop and kind of a monocle, you know, so it was a real disappointment for them and left an imprint of why would I bother going back in or, you know, that felt not great. Uh, So it's those type of moments. The others would be your onboarding. Everybody remembers their first day in the organization. And a lot of people remember their last day, which you, so many companies get wrong. Um, and it's so important because everyone else is looking on as well to see how you're treating people as they're exiting the organization. So so there's kind of a sample of imprintable moments by my definition and my experience, I suppose. And there's lots of others, you know, um, throughout the, the employee life cycle. Yeah, no, absolutely. I told you actually when we were kind of discussing leading up to today's discussion Mm -hmm. that um, it so happened that uh, someone recommended a book to me recently called The Power of Moments um, that really made me think about what you wrote about. Um, And in in the book, one of the frameworks, as I remember it, of course, I hope I'm not butchering Mm -hmm. this, but (laughs) in my you know, the author is going to write to me. That's not what I meant yeah, at all. Exactly. Um, <laughs> uh, so one of the ways in which they were discussing this was, first of all, to say that, um, as you say, in a in a journey, you know, if you're looking at the employee journey, there's the beginning and the end. And those are very important, right? So the recruitment and the onboarding that first day yeah. and then your last day, um, so to speak. There's also the pits and, and the peaks, as they describe them. So either it's the moments of, something's gone wrong, things are less than ideal, um, and and how do we build up from there? And another, the opposite of that is when things are, you know, you're expecting something incredible, it's it's a peak, right? Like, 
Um, and they were saying also that so many people and so many organizations spend a lot of time trying to fix what's broken, but it's also very valuable to elevate what's working really well, right? Like mm. a moment where someone triumphs, where they do something incredible, uh, where something beautiful happens, like having a child, whatever it is, mm. right? That you can really elevate that moment. Um, I was wondering if you could share perhaps a moment from your own career where you were not the designer of that moment, but perhaps the, the main mm. character of that moment and and mm. maybe you recall it in a fond way fond way <laughs> uh well there's one that I recall but maybe not in a fond way um because I just remember it was an imprintable moment and I wasn't the orchestrator but then subsequent to that I think that got me thinking about these moments and making sure that it crafted into the future you know um but Yeah, one of them was my first day in, in, a, in a role. And, you know, I arrived at the office. There was nobody there because I was actually going to be working earlier and was no, didn't go for lunch on my first day. So, and everyone was so busy and they were, you know, they did lots of lovely things, but it did feel on the first day. And it does leave, you know, where you're like, okay, right, I need to, to ensure that this doesn't happen. Um, I mean, another great one would be when I came back from maternity leave and um, when I was working for an organization and they had a lovely photo of myself and my baby because I'd sent it in and they framed it for me and they balloons on my desk and a big banner saying, welcome back. And, you know, and we all went out for lunch and I was also, you know, the first week I was going home at two o'clock every day. They said, don't do a full day. You know, you'll need to get home and work yourself in gently. And that was gorgeous. You know, that was Uh, really lovely felt they were delighted to see that I was back and it made it so much easier for me then to kind of integrate back in by having to do less hours and it was lovely yeah I appreciate that funny enough my first job my first day no one had lunch with me it was the saddest moment of my career I know um, and you do feel so awkward because people are heading off and then you're like you know kind of gathering your stuff you don't know where to go for lunch mm -hmm. You know, you're kind of sitting there having a sandwich and then you see some of the people that you don't really know and you're like, hi, and you just feel like such a, you know, oh. <laughs> I know exactly how that feels. Uh, but also recently, you know, I was giving a talk about, um, again, employee engagement. And I was saying that what causes people to be engaged sometimes is uh, not the best moment, right? They're not, there's not always positive experiences. Um, sometimes it's a negative experience. Like one example I always give from my first job was once it was like I think it was the second or third year I was there I had just become a manager um, and so it was the first time where my boss like gave me KPIs I had sales KPIs to fulfill and then I was managing a team um, I was a very competitive young one as you may or may not imagine um, and so I had like essentially hit the sales targets by the third quarter like I was done I was like you know and so at the end of the year I walked into this like performance review and I was like I'm going to nail this one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I'll never forget my boss at the time. He spent an hour and a half telling me what a shit manager I was. <laughs> um, in the sense that he, you know, he was trying to help me understand how you go from being an, indiv an individual contributor where you're trying to overachieve and be the best person in the room to when you manage others where actually it's not your time to shine and it's about helping each person grow on their own path and they may not be like you or do things the way you did them, but mm -hmm. it's still your job to help them grow. Mm -hmm. uh, and for me, that's one of the things that made me super engaged. Like it was such a terrible memory. Like I had tears in my eyes for an hour and a half. Then I cried for another five hours after that. You know, like it's not a happy memory, but it is a very yeah. happy memory mm -hmm. because it taught me a lot about what I needed to do to become a better version mm -hmm. of myself. And I think, you know, you laughed when I said fond. They don't have to be fond at the moment, <laughs> but perhaps they transform yeah. into something else as you yeah. go. And so one of the interview questions I ask a lot of people is, you know, what's the best feedback that they've ever gotten and what do they do then subsequently to deal with that? Because you're obviously testing to see how easy it is to take feedback and to take that and what they did with it and how they changed and do they have the ability to do that and how they received it, you know. But I think sometimes with feedback, if the manager's intention is a positive one and you genuinely felt that your manager was like, you know interested in you took the time he took an hour and a half it wasn't as if he just flicked you on a four or said you know you haven't hit and there's you know um he took an hour and a half to really you know explain that to you and you took those learnings obviously where you are today so it's great yeah to this okay. day honestly I think uh, that yeah. changed the course of uh, who I was to become mm. um 
speaking of that, like, are there any, you know, rituals or specific uh, moments let's say at work vivo that you you love particularly that you want to share for example an example i shared earlier today uh, in our previous live uh, is that at cosmic we do a graduation ceremony whenever anybody leaves the company um, and we have it on a mirror board where they we write about the stuff they've done we you know we ask them to write some advice for future centors uh, and whenever someone new joins they go and part of their onboarding is to look at the wall and see what people before them have contributed and kind of feel the sense of like, you know, they're in a long line of amazing people doing great things. Are there similar, um, you know, rituals that you, you have implemented that you'd like to share? Wow. Yeah. I'm just trying to think now. Um, we do such really accept people for who they are, which I love, you know, so we do lovely, sort of onboarding and they're part of actually the product as well and um, onboarding kind of videos and where people get to explain who they are what they love recipes they love and all that type of stuff but the main reason behind it is that we can then connect with people so like when we do spotlights or we do those type of videos we then and it's ingrained in the the culture contact the people like so say for our two weeks ago we had a girl start and she got married in Kevin and I got married in Kevin so then we reach out and we have a chat and we connect on those bases and we then have spaces set up for like random stuff like people who love a good joke or people who you know love baking and and you can serve you know share recipes and each of the spaces have different activity and you can be a member if you love these type of things which is really really good because the main thing that we're trying to do and I think we're trying to do in life is find that connection and commonality with each other. And I think that's really important for organizations as they go forward to ensure that they're setting up these connection points for people. Um, so yeah, the spaces are great. And then those onboarding videos just to find the connection um, with new people starting. We absolutely bring people out when they start for lunch. <laughs> we do loads around uh, team lunches and catch up. We do a weekly catch up with the whole organization every week without fail. And on those, then um, we have different uh, initi uh, initiatives that we run as well within those um, games and different things as well to get people to know each other that bit better. Yeah, I love that. We actually, with one of our earliest clients, um, we worked with a team of about 50 people, some of which had been working together for about eight years. And so we set up a very simple Google Doc, right, um, mm -hmm. with a few questions that every single person should answer. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them were related to work, of course, like, even sometimes you'd be surprised, like people don't even know other people's roles, you know, or what projects they're on, even mm -hmm. though they're part of mm -hmm. the yeah. And then some other questions were more personal, of course. Um, and to your point, like that commonality of having been married in the same place, um, we could see people kind of reacting and sharing comments mm -hmm. with each other about stuff they just learned about each other. And we were sitting there thinking like, they've been working together for eight years and just didn't mm -hmm. have the opportunity to have that fact emerge, you know, that yeah. they had this thing. And we are obviously blessed because we have the platform, but it's tiny things like, you know, first day at school, posting your kids starting the first day in school, you know. Um, and when I worked in Cubic Telecom, I was I implemented Work Vivo and that's how I found out about it. Mm -hmm. But in January, when it was really, really, you know, in Ireland, it's very, very cold and dreary. And we did like an operation transformation where we broke up lots of different teams into groups that wouldn't ordinarily work with each other. So, you know, departments that wouldn't normally see each other or people that wouldn't interact. And we did a little competition and it was all, you know, it was totally choice. I always believe you have to have a choice. You can't just force people into these things. And uh, they got points for like healthy food or if you're out for a walk and you send a picture of where you're walking and what you're doing. And we said that if you were out for your walk, maybe connect with a friend. And it drove really healthy competition within the organization. But most of all, it got people talking to each other that wouldn't ordinarily maybe pass or their work wouldn't really. And they formed friendships and commonality um, throughout the organization. And it was such a, you know, one of these initiatives that gives you that warm feeling. And, and that's what you're kind of looking for is to, to recreate that as best you can in this new setting, because it is more challenging now that people are remote and hybrid. It's much more challenging. What's what, I mean, we're not here to promote the product, but I'd love for you to share like one story about either you like your favorite feature or something beautiful that happened that was enabled by the tech that you guys build. 
Yeah. So, I mean, as I said, I, I got it when we went into Cubic Telecom and it's a little bit like what we said earlier about bringing your values and your, say, your strategic objectives. It was one of my pain points as CPO. People would uh, say, you know, I don't understand, you know, the strategic objectives yet. We communicated them about, you know, town halls and thought we did a great job. And I was like, oh, pulling my hair out. And what the platform allowed us to do was to bring them to life. So say we want to win a tier one um, airline or a partner and we could have, you know, people posting when they were out at a meeting with a potential customer, you know, out for dinner. The meeting went really well. So the whole company is updated without it being a formal PowerPoint or without it being and people can tag people saying thanks for your assistance on this strategic project. And you're getting informal updates whilst you know still some of the photos would obviously be humorous or you know and they would have people um from around the organization so i love that that it would bring it to life because it is difficult i think for some leaders to do that to bring strategy to life but really it was again the humans touch you know like i did a thing where it was the first day at school and i said to parents please make sure you make time to bring your kids to school this week it's really important the company would you know will change all meetings so you don't have to be in and everyone was posting up saying, thanks, Emil, here they are. And again, you know, you're sitting down with a cup of tea and you're going through and you're seeing people's lives and you're sharing a bit of yourself as well, which is what we're talking about around vulnerability and belonging. It's really sharing that bit of yourself. Um, and I think as organizations get bigger, it's harder to do that. So having something like this, which is each of you sharing bits of yourself, mm -hmm. maintains that um, and you feel part of something. Yeah, I love that. I get it. I mean, we're a small team and we make time for that every day, but I can easily imagine like if we tripled or quadrupled size, how that would maybe get lost in interest that's yeah. where technology is such a great enabler sometimes um you also you know you and i discussed this when we met you have a strong vision about what leadership should look like and the fact that we're all made to perhaps fit into a very masculine or patriarchal view of, of leadership you want to talk to us a little bit about that yeah and i think i alluded to it a little bit earlier that i think there has been a type of leadership um I sort of read Harvard Business Review, read all the articles, and we kind of put forward this view of leadership. But then in reality, it's very, very different. And it does tend to be the ambitious, you know, results focused, transactional, short term, um, and in the vise of confidence that wins out over, say, a more quieter leader that may be not demonstrating as much outward charisma or confidence. Um, and we don't seem to there seems to be that one style and you can call it you know the masculine or the feminine because the the feminine traits and men and women can demonstrate both by the way it's not that i'm saying um tend to be around nurturing intuitive and those type of um skill sets aren't really hailed within the workplace but i do think they are the skill sets of the future and i do think that we are going to need leaders that are much more in tune um, with whole systems, sustainability, um, much more long term in their view, um, less transactional, less about extraction and more about collaboration. And, and yes, you can say that it's like the yin or the yang or the anima, animas, masculine, feminine, whichever way you want to look at it. And I do, it, it, you know, male and female can demonstrate both of those. Um, but we, we definitely, I think, for our future and the sustainability of the businesses and the planet, we're going to have to change uh, the type of leaders. I mean, I just said to you in the line, I don't know how many Netflix documentaries we have to do before we say hello, <laughs> you know? Yeah, but the, it just keeps repeating, you know? You I think there's another the few. Yeah, well, there's loads, there's loads in there. I mean, the, the other pharmaceutical one as well. And I think there's oh a few, I, I'm looking on at the moment and I'd say there's another two or three Netflix documentaries happening in some organizations at the moment, you know. Um, but yeah, we seem to be just drawn to this, you know, overly ambitious, confident, transactional, you know, get the, get the, the result every quarter um, quick as we can and... And I just don't think long term that's going to work. I mean, really, we should be building sustainable, resilient businesses, um, because when you look ahead with so many crises, like you couldn't even count the amount of crises we have ahead of us on one hand. 
So really to try and pivot and deal with all of those is, is pointless, you know. So really what people should be doing is thinking about how do I build a really responsible, sustainable business? And you do that by having exceptionally good relationships with your employees, making sure you're looking after their well-being and that they are going to be able to, to go the, the term with you and uh, looking after your partners, your suppliers, having quality relationships with them, not trying to, you know, drain everything out of them and take everything from them and extract you want to have quality so when the chips are down that they'll work with you um so in order for the business to survive and society you're going to have to work with your communities and you know have that social responsibility um because all of us at the end of the day like we're all interconnected and um, nothing is separate that's for sure Yeah, you're making me think of a book. I don't know if you've read it. And if you haven't, I think you'd love it. It's called Humankind. Um, it's a it's a it's very similar to Homo sapiens in like the way that it's written, in the sense that it refers to a lot of like academic research and so on, but it's written in a way that is like high on storytelling. And one of the things that I always, you know, it, essentially it's trying to prove the point that in reality, Homo sapien is a kind being, um, but explains why we end up doing things like going to war and murdering each other. Um, but one of, the, one of the things you're making me think about is that one of the reasons why sapiens became the dominant kind of Homo species is actually because we're better at collaboration. So if you look at, mm. if you compare sapiens to a Neanderthal, actually Neanderthal are individually more intelligent. They had a bigger brain. They could come up with individually, they could come up with more innovation. But what they were not very good at, they weren't hardwired to collaborate. And because we are, that's what allowed us to kind of become the dominant species, so to speak. And I think what you're saying really resonates with me in, in going back to doing that and building community and thinking sustainably. I always say also that I love working with family businesses um, because they don't have the pressure of even when they're public, they don't care um, because they they think generation they're generationally rather than quarter by quarter. It allows you to be with leaders who have a long term view by default almost. Yeah. And, and I really appreciate that about them. Um, how would you advise leaders who are in that, I mean, we're all in that pressure, right? Like we have the business KPIs, we have to perform uh, now more than ever. We just came out of a pandemic. We're facing a recession. The price of energy is rising, you know, like a lot of tension there to also, let's say, prioritize performance over care sometimes. Um, how would you help leaders to kind of rebalance those two things in their own minds? Yeah, I do. I do. It's a difficult one, you know, and, and it's a challenge sometimes chief people officers have and we have it over and over again, you know, because we know the right things to do. We read all the research, but it's like, do you know that Indiana movie where he has to do he's going for the body of Christ the, 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 and he has to take this leap of faith. I feel like it's like that. It is a leap of faith. I mean, there's so much research to show that if you are your people are engaged, we know you get an extra 30%. Uh, you know, it, it makes logical sense. But I think the fact that it's a time proven thing that you apply the pressure, you get the results, you apply the pressure, you get the result, that it's very, very hard cycle to break um, because you're kind of taking away this command and control. And I actually think it's what you're seeing now when you hear all this uh, very annoying hashtag quiet quitting you know but it is it's the big showdown because people are saying you know no no more of this you know you're not dragging me back into the office I want to have choice over things that I do so I think the command and control model is going to come under a lot of pressure um, and I think people will leave organizations that pressure them into things and don't give them a choice or don't engage with them so what they'll end up happening is they will have retention issues it'll start costing them money Um, and they may be the last to kind of change, but the really progressive businesses, if they can master this, they will have a competitive advantage. They'll get the best talent and they will start building sustainable businesses that in the long term um, will, you know, absolutely. I mean, when you extract all the time and damage the relationships, I mean, your own instinct tells you that you can't keep pushing people or have your foot on the back for the next 20 or 30 years. Like people are not 
we won't sustain as as human beings mm. um and and we're trying to manage humans like machines because a lot of us are in in technology and we're trying to break down process and we're trying to manage people like machines and we're not um so yeah i think the the pain that we're feeling at the moment everything that you're seeing in the media is the pain of real change and a lot of people say you know we're in a paradigm shift and and i believe we are i believe this is a moment in in history and the world of work is going to change and hopefully for the better yeah i agree in fact i'm a big advocate of changing the denomination human resources mm. um similar to it you know i think mm. if you call someone you say you're in it then they're going to be fixing printers yeah. <laughs> you know yeah if yeah you're in the business of managing human resources then you're going to treat them as if they were machinery or assets yeah, um, yeah. you got to start thinking about it with new words perhaps that might be more helpful Yeah, no, the whole profession is completely under construction at the moment, I would say, you know. Um, It's an exciting time. I do hope, as you say, I hope it ends up, even if we go through a bit of, uh, you know, pain in the process, I do hope it ends up in a better place than where it started. Mm -hmm. Um, I do believe in humanity's ability to continue to progress and evolve. So I'm optimistic about that. And I think so. Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah well they always say you know even with humans uh the pain you know people have to start feeling real pain before they'll actually make change and i think that's what we're experiencing now we're in the height of that which will spur change which would be a good thing well i i look forward to seeing what it looks like on the other end and with that we're coming to the end of our um time together it was a really great conversation i think we could keep going for for a little while if I'm allowed, but I'm going to take us to our rapid fire questions. Are you ready for them? Yes. All right. Please complete these statements. Great employee experience is? Hmm. Where you feel like you matter and you belong. Beautiful. The book that every leader should read today? Uncharted and Willful Blindness. (laughs) at the you know in succession uh, margaret hefferton i think she's amazing actually read all her stuff but uncharted which is very relevant for now willful blindness beautiful i'm not familiar with that one i shall mm-hmm. uh, she's great yeah. the ideal workplace is work vivo <laughs> <laughs> Our- yeah, they're all lovely people so I was I was racking my brains to think and i was like i can't say anybody else even though apologies Listen, i never worked I mean- with them we all know that ambassadorship is one of the greatest <laughs> outcomes of greatly engaged people. So there you go. Um, and the secret ingredient to a great employee experience is? Caring about people. Yeah, I love that. Thank you so much for that, Jillian. And thank you for your time today. Um, it was a really wonderful discussion. And I do hope that people you know, leave this thinking, what can I do tomorrow to make my workplace more humane and to build my community and to care? for others, as you say. And as always, a thank you to our attendees who tuned in, whether they're watching today or two years from now. Uh, This video will remain available on LinkedIn. We'll post it later on our website and YouTube um, channel should you want to come back and watch it again. Um, And with that, we come to the end of today's session. Join me again. Well, you'll be joining Tala, in fact, tomorrow at 5 p.m. Dubai time. She'll be hosting Dr. Susan Roman, uh, who's a lecturer of management at Bentley University. And actually, they will talk about how to rethink leadership in your organization Um, but also I want to say that um, the team at Cosmic Centers is really you know the people who make this happen I uh, just uh, show up here and and try to do well by their work so um, you know give them a sign of approval go on our website maybe sign up to our newsletter or follow us on social media Um, the team Karma Atala and everybody who's contributing to the content that we create will be really happy to see that happen Um, and with that Jillian thanks again so much for your time today and see you you. really enjoyed it